You are watching Apostolic Radio Charlotte. I'm going to read verse number 14, and then I'm going to preach an amazing, wonderful message, and uh, everything's going to be great. At least that's the plan. And Hezekiah received the letter from the hand of the messengers and read it, and Hezekiah went up to the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. Look at verse number 16. This is what he says to the Lord. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Hear the words of Sennacherib. Now, if you are looking for a name for your child, and you don't want to follow the normal, Sennacherib, you just can hear someone say, Sennacherib, I brought you in this world, I'll take you out. Actually, I wouldn't recommend using that name. It means man of sin. So you can name your ex-boyfriend that. How about that? Uh, Don't use that for your children. Listen, Lord, to what the man of sin has written us. So I'm going to preach from this title, The Pen Pal from Hell. Hmm. I forgot the bishop came in. I would have changed my title, but somebody say in Jesus' name. God bless you. You may be seated. Real quick, first of the year, we're going to a two separate service Sunday morning schedule to accommodate the crowd. Um, if we're this is just a normal Sunday, and if we get crowded at all, it gets difficult. Uh, and for people who come in as a family to find seats, um, there tends to be some seats here in the middle, but it's, we're going to go ahead and take the growth jump and start having an 11 o'clock uh, service and a 9 o'clock service. And um, we are trying to organize to grow and influence people uh, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So, just want you to be aware of that. Uh, I want to remind you that... In this book of the Bible here, 2 Kings, we're reading the story of Hezekiah. And Hezekiah has tried to bring a renewal, a spiritual renewing to the house of Israel. Now, why is this important? Well, the house of Israel, it desperately needs a renewal. Uh, Let me remind you that all of us were created by God and we were created for a divine purpose and a divine calling. Through sin, we lost our place with God. Are you you guys with me in the scripture? We lost our place with God. That's why Paul talks about the church having a ministry of reconciliation. What does that mean? That's just a fancy churchy word to mean bringing people back to God. Okay? Let me, let me keep your attention. We got the kids coming back in. It's a little bit of a hairball. It's all right. They'll be settled in just a minute. A ministry of reconciliation is just bringing people back to where they were supposed to be. They were supposed to be God's people. Amen? God had created them for a purpose. Yes? But through sin, they fell out of that right place, that right relationship with God. And what they need, what every person who has not committed themselves to God what they need is a reconciliation they need to be brought back Paul goes further than just to use that word he says the ministry of the church essentially is a ministry of reconciliation people don't even know that they would be happier serving God but they would be happier people don't even know their lives would have more meaning if they would serve God but their lives would have more meaning and as a church our job is to continually tell the world and show the world, look, if you will get back in a relationship with God, everything is going to be better. And so Hezekiah is leading the children of Israel back into this place there are supposed to be. And it's, it's interesting to me how as long as Jerusalem would remain under the control of King Sennacherib, there was no problem, there was no trouble, there was no threat. But as soon as the children of Israel started getting away from that 
and saying we're going to go our way, we're going to run our own affairs, we're going to serve our own God. As soon as that started happening, all of a sudden Sennacherib started making threats. Let me remind you, as long as your life is filled with spiritual apathy, hell has no reason to send you a letter. As long as you're doing the job of being apathetic, the devil has no reason to get involved in your life. As long as all you care about is another paycheck and a weekend, the enemy feels no threat from you. But you let people put God on the throne of their life and their heart. You let a church get the purpose of the calling of God in its vision. You let someone say, no, no, the man of sin is not going to run things around here. We're going back to God, all of a sudden, the devil cares enough to write you a letter. All of a sudden, the pen pal from hell says, hey, I have something to say to you. I I have a word or two for you. And this is exactly what happened. It had not happened in a moment. It had taken some time. In fact, this king... (coughs) Excuse me. This king, Sennacherib, had gathered his army... And he had already taken the northern ten tribes of Israel into captivity. And all that was left was the the two tribes down in Judah. That's all that was left. The rest had been scattered into the nations and even into history. There's these two tribes down in Judah that are remaining. And Sennacherib writes a letter basically saying this, I'm going to do to you what I have already done to your cousins in the north. The difference, however, the difference is that the nation of uh, Israel in Judah, they are experiencing a religious revival. They are getting back to where they need to be. They're reminding themselves that there's more to life than just this stuff that I am accumulating. I want to get back into serving God and honoring God. That's what's happening, a revival. A revival is just a churchified word for people getting back to where they need to be. Look at your neighbor. Say, now he's talking to you. (laughs) That's all a revival is. Now, we talk about it all the time. We call any special meeting, we call it a revival. But that's just what church folks do. What the point is this. It is a ministry of reconciliation. It's getting people back to where they need to be in God. And I have a job here today. I want to encourage somebody to get back to where you need to be in God. You would be happier. Your life would be more blessed. You would be better at your career. Your marriage would be better. Your kids would like you better. Your parents would like you better if you would get back to where you need to be in God. And so here, King Hezekiah, he, he's done that which is right in the sight of the Lord. He removed the high places. All of us need to remove high places. You know, it's ironic that, um, that, that we don't think we worship idols, and yet uh, we, have, uh, we may be the most idolatrous nation ever. We're just not superstitious. We don't have superstitious idols. We have idols of the lust of the flesh and the pride of life. And we worship those idols. We need, as people, to break down the high places. Anything that we value more than our relationship with God, we need to break it down. We need to cast it into the fire. We need to draw back to God. This is what's happening in Judah. And they're doing it. And all of a sudden, they get the attention of this man of sin. And he sends this letter... And he tells them, I am going uh, uh, to destroy you. I'm coming. I'm bringing my army. I'm going to destroy you. Now you read in verses 19 and 20 where the messenger is sent. Uh, this is Second Kings 18 um, and 19. And, Rab- and, and Rabshakeh said unto them, Speak ye now to Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but their vain words, uh, I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust that thou rebellest against me? Let me tell you, the most success that the enemy will ever have in your life is to defeat you before you ever have to fight. You see, the Bible describes the enemy as a master liar. 
Not only is he a liar, he's the father of liars. It lying found its inception in him. And his genius is to get you to surrender before you even have to fight. And he wants to place doubt. He wants to place questions. Uh, who is this you are trusting in? He's hoping uh, that because he doesn't believe, uh, you won't believe either. Come on, there's some sophisticated theology behind this. I'm preaching this as a story. But there's some sophisticated theology behind this. He's thinking that because he didn't believe, uh, he will lead you in not believing. He's thinking that because he would not submit himself to God, he will lead you in not submitting yourself to God. He's thinking that because he would not stay in his right place and worship God, he will lead you in out of your right place and you will not worship God. His greatest success is to talk you into quitting. To talk you into giving up. To talk away your faith. To convince you uh, that you might as well just give up before there's a battle. Hezekiah has already decided he's not going to give up. He's not going to believe the lie. He is not going uh, to stand with this man of sin. And so you read in verse 25, Am I now come up without the Lord against this place to destroy it? The Lord said to me, Go up against this land and destroy it. This is the lie the devil wants you to believe. This is Sennacherib speaking. He's saying, Look, God is not with you. God's not on your side. You are defeated before we ever fight. God has forsaken you. And your problems are the result of your failures. That's what Sennacherib is saying. I am God's judgment. And you know what? What he's saying is true. But let me tell you, it's not the whole truth. How did The serpent deceive Eve by putting question marks on what God has said. Half the time the enemy deceives us not by telling us a true, a a lie, but by twisting something we already believe and we think that's the end of the story. Let me remind you, the devil should never get the last word in your life. When he tells you you're going to get, you're, you're, you're defeated, don't stop with him. You go find yourself an altar and you say, now God, I have heard that I'm defeated, but I have a question for you today. Am I defeated? And it might surprise you to hear God say, No, you're not defeated. I'm with you. (laughs) This is the success of the pen pal from hell. To get you to believe that he has the last word. But let me remind you of a little bit of prophecy without getting too deep into prophecy. A dirty little secret you can remind the enemy of. The devil not only doesn't get the last word, he's never going to get the last word. So he can talk and he can threaten and he can intimidate, but he is never going to get the last word. After he's told you, you might as well quit. Find yourself a prayer closet and say, now Lord, it has been said that I might as well quit. I wanted to know what you thought about it. One of our one of our pastors tells a story. I have it on one a, a tape, preaching tape somewhere. Tells a story about how a a man who had served the Lord for many years uh, came into the office and he was suffering with depression and a lot of things in his life. Sat down across from the pastor and he said, "Pastor, I just want you to know that I've I've fought as long as I can fight. I can't make it anymore. I'm giving up. I, I'm ashamed to say it, but I just I cannot. I, I just I've got to make a change and I'm gonna I'm gonna. I, you won't be seeing me at church anymore. I want to." give you my key. I'm not going to be coming back anymore. I've, I've done what I can do and I've just, I'm exhausted. I'm, I'm just, I just, I'm done. I need a change. And the pastor uh, tells the story. He tells it in the message he preached. He said, uh, I, at first he didn't know what to say and he, he I, I tried to say a few things to encourage him and the man was just resolute. And I, I understand that better now. You can always tell when someone doesn't want your help. They have amazing ways of letting you know. And uh, he tried to encourage him and he, you know, and he said, no, I, I'm done. And so finally the pastor he tells the story in his message he said i didn't know what to do 
He said, so I, I told him, but before you leave, you told me that the church is not the problem, God's not the problem, you just, this trouble in your life, you just, you need a change. Before you leave, I, I would like you to go into the sanctuary there, and I'd like you to find yourself a, a spot, and I'd like you to just tell the Lord goodbye. He said, you've already made up your mind. You've admitted to me, and you're not mad at me. You're not mad at the church. You've just made up your mind. So I just think it would be rude. <laughs> if you would leave this house where you were repented of your sins in this altar, and you were baptized, and you were filled with the Spirit, you have so much history here. I'd like you to go into the church, and I'd like you to just tell the Lord you're sorry. You've done your best. You can't keep it up. And just tell Him goodbye. The man sat there for a minute, didn't know what to do, and he said, uh, well, okay, okay. <laughs> and he walked in the church and went over where he normally sat and he nailed down. And the pastor kept waiting him to come out. And the man didn't come out. And finally the pastor stuck his head in the door and he could hear the man just sobbing where he sat in church. The pastor kind of walked quickly to him and knelt down beside him and put his hand on his shoulder and said, how's it going? And the man says, I can't tell God goodbye. He's been too good to me. He's been too good to me. He's brought me through too much. Sometimes I'm exhausted, Sister Vicky. Sometimes I just, I, I'm exhausted. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I wish I could show up and no one say a thing to me. I'm just exhausted. You know how I feel. Just nod your head right. You know what I mean? I know you know how I feel, brother. I just, I've just, I'm ready to give up. I've added, Brother Carlos, I know music's the most frustrating part in the church. It is. You think you have it. Let me just tell you real quick. Uh, um, uh, Sister Megan, where are you at? Sister Megan, I, you encouraged me today. You just ministered to me. Her brother died last night. And she, she could have left. She could be with her family right now. She said, no, I want to be there to lead worship today. And she's here today. That ministers to me. That's the kind of people you can build a church around right there. Oh, I just, I'm sick of it. I'm tired of other people's problems. I Sometimes I go home, I tell my wife, I say, I don't feel like I have any problems. I, if it's just us, we mostly can get along, you know. You say what to do and I do it. We have a really good working relationship. And it's awesome. And, you know, and, and, and I can't, I'm sick of problems. And you feel the same way. You get frustrated. You get tired. You get exhausted. You, 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 uh, and, and, and about that time, you think, I, oh, Lord, I, I just need to step back. <laughs> I just need a break. But about the time you go to tell the Lord goodbye, you are reminded of how much God has done for you. Oh, so when you're overwhelmed and you're exhausted and your pen pal from hell writes you a letter and it goes like this, look, your life is an embarrassment. You tried, you had dreams, they, did, they all kind of fell apart. Look at you. You had dreams and look at you now. You can't hardly even get to church yourself. Look at you. You ought to just give up. You're tired. The enemy shows up on you and you can think of all the embarrassments in your life and how, how this didn't work out and that didn't work out. And you, you want to just stop before you stop and let the devil have the last word. Before you stop and let have that pen pal that's your enemy, that man of sin, have the last word in your life. You need to take the rumor, take the fear, take the letter, take the problem, take the shame. Did you hear me? I used the shame word. Take the shame and you take it into the presence of God. And you lay that out before the Lord. Now, Lord, the devil says, I'm just a big embarrassment. And the devil says, I might as well just quit. And the devil says, it's all done. But I have made a determination in my mind. I'm not letting the devil get the last word. I'd like to know what you say. Let me tell you what the Lord says to the man of sin. Sennacherib's army has surrounded the city. He's brought his mighty host to, bring the, to do the same thing to Judah, what they've done to Israel. And 
the Lord decided he had something to say after all. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, four score, and five thousand. A hundred, four score, and five thousand. A hundred and eighty-five thousand. And the Bible says, oh, this is one of my favorite scriptures. And when they all woke up in the morning, they were dead. I know it's a play on words, but I love the way it sounds. The man of sin, he's tried to destroy you as long as he's known you. But there's a day he's going to wake up dead. Let me give you a profound theological truth that you can take to your grave. The enemy is not going to get the last word. The enemy is not going to get the last word. You say, oh no, I feel like it's over. That's a feeling. It's not the truth. God still has something to say. You say, there's no hope for me. I got out of church when I was young. I, I should have known better. And I, my, my, parent, my grandmother, my mother, my father, they were religious. I got out. I gave up. And I haven't been in church in years. And I, my life is a mess. And I just came in here today because someone guilted me into it. We might have someone here like that today. Uh, let me tell you something. That's not the end of the story. Let me finish with this story. I love it because you'll remember stories. You'll forget what I preach, but you'll remember the story. Remember the passage in the Old Testament where the shepherd can only find a couple ribs and a piece of an ear. And that's all that's left. Can God do anything with what is left? Life is cruel. It's cruel. Time is cruel. Let me tell you, God can do something with what's left. Ezekiel stood before an army of bones. Can God do anything with what's left? And the Lord's like, I was hoping someone would ask that question because I still have something to say. Defeat doesn't get the last word. I get the last word. And behold, out of a valley of dry bones, an army came together and an army was assembled. The angel of the Lord encampeth around them that fear him. And he will deliver them. One more thing. Just because it's so good, I want to direct you to a letter that the Lord wrote back to the man of sin. This is the letter when you think that hell is going to get the last word in your life. You need to go to Psalms chapter number 46. And you need to get that out and you need to lay it beside the letter that you got. God is our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear even though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Maha! That's in the text. And though its waters roar and be trembled, and though the mountains shake with its swelling. There is a river whose streams shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her just at the break of dawn. The nations raged. The kingdoms were moved. God spoke. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us.
Verse 10. This is the end of it. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Hell doesn't get the last word. Let's all stand. All right, I've been preaching to more than three of you, okay? I've been preaching to a good number of you. And you feel right now faith in your heart. You feel the preaching. You're like, yeah, that's right. Why haven't I been reminding myself of that? You feel that in your spirit. Right now, is it, we're going to have a prayer service. And if you are facing a situation like this and you need the strength that Hezekiah experienced when God came through in his trouble, this is the moment right now. I want to activate your faith. I want you to be able to believe, not just a, in a manner of listening, but when you go out of this church, I want you to have Monday faith, not just Sunday faith. If you have a need, if I've been preaching to you, raise your hand all across the church house. All across the church house. All right? Right now, I'm going to invite you to come to the front right now. Come to the front right now. Make yourself vulnerable before God. We're not going to embarrass you. I promise you, we're not going to embarrass you. We'll just pray with you right here. You, you, you'll, be control, you'll be in control at all times. We're not going to embarrass you. We want to activate faith here today. Now, church, I'd like some of you to step out and start finding somebody and take their hand and put a head on their shoulder, whatever, whatever's appropriate. Those of you still in your seats, I, I, I'd like to encourage you to have the confidence to pray with someone right by you. Take, take someone's hand right by you. Put a hand on their shoulder. We're going to turn this whole service into a prayer service right now. We have some of our prayer chaplains that's going to come down and pray with these in the altar. I'd like those of you with strong faith today, I'd like you to come down here and find someone and pray with them. Let's turn this whole house into a house of faith, into a powerful prayer service in Jesus name right now. Lord God, we call upon you right now. We believe that you will intervene in every life. Lord Jesus, we believe that your spirit will not just be something we feel on an emotional level, but it'll get down where we're living. It'll get down where we're living, oh God. for listening to Apostolic Radio Charlotte. Come worship with us.